As a member of Congress, Sam had already done for this country more than almost anybody else in his lifetime could. You see, Sam was an Air Force pilot. He flew missions in Korea and Vietnam. He was shot down. He served in Hanoi Hilton seven years. Three and a half of those years was in solitary confinement. Sam was one of those type of individuals it's just an honor to get to know. But I want to tell you some personal stories about Sam so the rest of the country can know who this real hero was. Sam was on my deputy whip team. And when Sam would come to the meetings, we always had one special chair for him. But there's one thing Sam always wanted, these chocolate crisp Krispy Kreme donuts. And it's amazing. You could sit there, and he could eat three, four donuts all within a meeting. And I remembered one day we had um, some new staff, and they didn't get Krispy Kreme. And I heard Sam say something about it. I quickly called another staff member who was still home that lived up by a Krispy Kreme to bring him on down. And when we went to the floor that day, I snuck in a couple Krispy Kremes for Sam on the floor. And when you looked at his face and smiled, you knew that he deserved it. You know, every new Congress, I would buy a number of Sam's books, Captive Warrior. And the reason I would buy them is I remember reading it as a freshman. And for anyone who's ever tried reading this book, you cannot read it in one setting you will become emotionally upset knowing what he had to go through. Telling of his life story, telling of him being shot down, the treatment, the broken arms, the number of times as a prisoner being put in, he'd tell a story of the North Vietnamese putting a rifle to his head or taking him out, out to killing him. And in that moment came when he's telling this story, he'd almost smile and he goes, you know what? Your gun jammed. He could find happiness in the most unbelievable times. And in reading this book, it brought me to tears at times, knowing what he had to go through. And I remember seeing him on the floor one day, and I walked up to him as a freshman. I said, Sam, I just finished your book. I just want to thank you for your service. And um, I have to tell you, I, I can't believe the things you went through. Sam just hit me and said, oh, you could have done it. No, very few people could ever have done what he did. Even in the times of his uh, almost daily beatings, it tells at the time uh, when I'd take, him, I'd take him to dinner, I'd buy all the freshmen of the book, he would sign it, and um, he loved Ruth Chris. You know, there's a certain one that he wanted to go to, a certain steak he wanted to buy, and a certain red wine. And as we would go, he would tell the stories, and we'd give him all the books. And I remember him telling this one story, it's in the book as well, that he was being brought in to one of his captors who would beat him. And he knew what was going to happen again. And as you knew Sam, he still was a hard time to walk, didn't have feelings in his hands from the beatings that he had taken, or his legs being shackled together. Um, he goes to the individual who's his captor holding him, and he tells him, hey, we're going to escape and we're going to go back to America. Do you want to go with us? He never lost the sight of the greatness of this country. That, this, that America is more than a country, that America is an idea. An idea worth fighting for, dying for. And he proved it every step of every day of his life. And we lost somebody that walked these halls that was an honor to serve with, an honor to call friend. And I think he deserves more time than just the time I was able to give to him today. Now let's talk a little bit about this week. Um, it was a historical week. A week we have not seen in the 231 years of history of this chamber. For the first time, the Democrats have now allowed proxy voting. You know, through the history of America, from the yellow fever of 1793, to the Civil War, to even this building being burnt down during the War of 1812, to 9-11, to World War II, all of those challenges we've always found the opportunity to meet, that we believe we are essential, 
just as all those Americans out there are doing their essential work as well, from the doctors to the delivery drivers to the dispatchers. Unfortunately, the Democrats believe differently. Two weeks ago, we voted on the HEROES Act, and 12 Democrats could not make it. Yesterday, even though they were given a two-week notice when to come back, more than 70 voted by proxy. In coming to this proxy decision, the Speaker and, and Chairman McGovern gave a lot of stringent facts of how this would be used. In fact, the guidelines specifically stated that you must be unable to physically attend proceedings in the House chambers due to ongoing health emergencies. The Speaker insisted voting by proxy was intended to be the last resort, an alternative to traveling to D.C. due to health concerns. And rules Chairman McGovern promised that this unprecedented step would be temporary and tied to a pandemic. Yesterday, Democrat Congressman Charlie Chris admitted he used the proxy vote to attend a space launch in Florida, an event that's 150 miles away from his district on the other side of the state. To get there, Charlie, it took him about two and a half hours to drive there, about the same amount of time as a flight from D.C., from Tampa to D.C. But instead of going to work and serving as a voice of his constituents, Charlie decided to play hooky. But in doing so, Charlie sent the House of Representatives a letter that he signed. And in signing this letter, Charlie said, I am unable to physically attend proceedings in the House chambers due to the ongoing public health emergency. But he drove two and a half hours to watch a launch outside of his district and gave somebody else the power to vote. I wonder if Charlie will cash his check this month. I wonder if those 70 Democrats will still take their check. The question before all members of Congress on their first day is to raise their hand and swear to uphold the Constitution. The Constitution is very clear about this. They expect us to assemble. If you take Chairman McGovern's own words when he first looked at this, he was concerned about proxy voting because of the constitutionality of it. He was right then, but he's wrong now. They believe that Congress can write their own rules. Congress can write their own rules. They just can't write unconstitutional rules. If you take them at their word, they can write a rule that says Republicans only get half a vote, that women cannot vote. That would be Congress writing their own rules. Article 1, Section 4, Section 5, and Section 6. Very clear we're supposed to assemble. Very clear that if you're not at work, they could find a place and get you and bring you. Very clear that someone cannot obstruct you from getting to the work. For 231 years, we found the ability to do that. But why would they want to go against the Constitution to provide proxies. It provides the Speaker more power, that is true. The Speaker, in her own words yesterday, admitted that the crisis is an opportunity. Every crisis is. She's not the only one on the Democrat side that believes that. Congresswoman Jay Paul, for me, the leverage is that there is enormous suffering. The number three, Congressman Clyburn said, this is a tremendous opportunity to restructure things to fit our vision. And last week, even Democrats admitted their legislative proposal was more of a wish list than a serious proposal at that. A pandemic is not an opportunity. A health crisis is not a free-for-all to restructure our government. We instead should be working together to reinforce the promise and progress we are seeing take place in this country. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Um, same question I had for Pelosi last week um, on the Scarborough issue. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate for a sitting president to accuse a TV host of murder over Twitter? I think I answered that yesterday. I don't have anything further to discuss you said you about it. I wasn't around when Scarborough was here. 
Look, I answered it yesterday. I don't think there's anything further to discuss. Yes. Uh, yeah. A question I asked uh, Pelosi as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on this on the president's uh, upcoming executive order on these uh, social media giants when it comes to uh, the uh, th this uh, liability issue when it comes to uh, going on, going after certain tweets that uh, people make? Well. This is one place I, I'd actually agree that the president should be looking into. It's something we did in the majority. I have not seen the new majority take any opportunity from committees to bring them in. We brought a number of the um, CEOs in. I agree with what Mark Zuckerberg said when he said that social media shouldn't be the arbiter of truth of everything that people say online. And it's interesting to me with Twitter, if you're going to hire somebody to be the arbiter, you ought to at least look at what they tweeted. Should the arbiter be an individual that believes any states in the Midwest that he refers to as flyover states that voted for President Trump are racist? Or would he believe those who work for the president should be similar to, call them similar to Nazis who worked for uh, Hitler? I would find that a hard truth to see that they were the arbiters. Um, I've watched what social media has been able to do. Um, there's a concern from a monopoly perspective on some. But I think what Mark Zuckerberg said is the approach that they should take, and I think what the president is doing is correct. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Leader, uh, the speaker this morning on FISA uh, criticized you and your Republican colleagues for basically uh, doing a 180 on the FISA vote because the president sent a tweet. I uh, wonder if you wanted to respond to that. And second, what is the path forward on this bill? Um, previously, many Republicans have said these are very crucial national security authorities that need to be there for national security reasons. Do we have to wait for the outcome of the Durham investigation to move forward? What, what possibly is the path forward here? The path forward is exactly what I told um, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer just a couple days ago. I would take a pause because every single day we learn something new. Remember what FISA is from Foreign Intelligence Surveillance. But it was used for surveillance on Americans. And every day we learn something more. Shouldn't we take an opportunity to correct that? Lo and behold, the speaker is now coming to the same position I told him would probably be best a couple days ago. Maybe she's upset by that. But I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Why don't we get back together, work with the administration, find out any more unmaskings from a past administration of how they misused this FISA and others and correct it so no American could go through this again. Interesting to me that the former vice president now running for president unmasked people. Ambassadors that were appointed by President Obama were unmasking people. Then look at the time frame of when it was done. After the election. After someone's duly elected become president, in a time frame of a lame duck presidency from the beginning of January to being sworn in in mid-January. Very interesting. While at the same time, they know from their own individuals all what they are professing to the American public about Russia was not true. Yeah, there are some grave concerns here, and they should be fixed. Mr. Leader, to follow up, this, the unmasking issue is unrelated to no, it goes, it, goes, it, it goes to a part of it. I know that goes a little further, but this is an opportunity to fix it as well. Are you concerned that the, the roving wiretap, the loan walk, the business records provisions, that those are going to put, having those expire, are going to put Americans at risk while you guys... They, don't have, to, they don't have to expire. While you work on this bill, you could extend it. Um, but I think the appropriate place to be is exactly what I, the advice I gave to Democrats two days ago, that they're coming to that advice today. You should maybe get into conference and find out the differences, just as we do in regular order on any other bill. Yes, sir. Leader McCarthy, if everything under proxy vote it would you think would be unconstitutional, then what about the PPP uh, fixed vote today? Would that be unconstitutional then? I think everything taken up reads the doubt of whether it's constitutional or not. Um, it brings a real doubt and why the Democrats should not move forward. With it. That's why um, Morgan Griffith yesterday did a previous question to pause using proxies until the courts can decide. Um, it is a legitimate question. It's about the constitutionality of anything they want to move forward. And it's a clean 
version of what you're seeing with the Democrats saying that this would only be used for members that have uh, problems coming because of health. Well, that's not the case if only 12 missed two weeks ago and more than 70 now. More than their largest delegation comes from California. More than half of all the Democrats in California stayed home. Is it being used the way the Speaker and McGovern promised? McGovern, even in his first review of it, said there's real questions about constitutionality. So it's not just the scholars that believe this is wrong. They did too. But they chose to try to invoke more power, and I think that is wrong. I also know we've – let's take a couple questions from Zoom, and then we can come back. Do we have anybody, anybody – ooh, big echo. Questions, comments? May we go? Yes. Yes. I'll do. Um, we will be taking a question from Julie Grace Blesky with the Hill. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, use the chat function directly with the moderator. Julie Grace, your line is open. Hi, Leonard McCarthy. Um, yesterday, the Blue Dog Coalition sent a letter calling for um, a bipartisan task force on China. I know that uh, initially the GOP task force was supposed to be bipartisan. I was wondering if there were any talks between leaders since that letter went out about maybe opening that up to both uh, to both parties or uh, whether the ship sailed now that he's already started a new poll. Who did you send that letter to, the speaker or to me? Because, because. let me pause. Um, as many of you know, more than a year ago, I went to the Democratic leadership and I requested a bipartisan committee on China. It took me a number of months to finally get them to agree. We agreed on who would be on it, the same number of Republicans, the same number of Democrats. Because the challenge we have in the next century will be about China. And we should have one strategy coming out of Congress. Not a Republican, not a Democrat, but an American strategy. The Democrats agreed, but when it came for the time to announce it, they backed away. In announcing that we couldn't sit back and wait, now that you found what had come through from COVID through China, um, the speaker declined again. I welcome Democrats from joining our task force. The speaker was asked about China. She was asked about the task force. You know what her answer was? That's a diversion. Is it a diversion of more than 100,000 Americans killed by this virus? Is it a diversion of what China just decided when it came to Hong Kong? Is it a diversion to stand for freedom? Sam Johnson would not have said it was a diversion. He understood what freedom meant because he was denied it for seven years. I welcome Democrats joining our task force, and I'd allow them. Because I want America to win the next century as well. Yes. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what, what purpose does a pause serve in, in renewing FISA? What do you hope to learn about unmasking in a conference committee to deal with a completely unrelated law? Well, you're, 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 you're taking two things and merging them together. No, you well, no. Well, then let me, let me state it in the manner in which my head and maybe my mouth did, so you'd understand it better. <laughs> um, when I called him two days ago, there was a concern that this was not going to be signed. So I said, why don't you pause, and why don't we work on this with the administration? Because I'm not interested in doing some political game, because I believe FISA is very important. And let's solve the concerns, and let's make law. They chose to do differently. So we spent all day yesterday, late into the night, until they finally came to a conclusion that they could not pass it. So what would you do now in this predicament? I would send it to conference. That's what regular order is. You have a Senate bill that the House could not pass. You have a House bill. Go to conference and work on trying to solve the differences. That's the appropriate way to go. Let me, let me go try to go. Huh? It has nothing to do with unmasking. Well, I think what has happened, every day we learn more. 
Every day we learn more of what has happened to Americans. You might say that doesn't take up with the three instances of what's happening in FISA that we're taking up at this time, but it also deals with FISA. So there is an opportunity. If you learn new information, are you going to wait three years to stop something being used against Americans, or would you take an opportunity now to do something with it? I think there is a window. Let's go back to Zoom. Our next question then comes from Paul Corson with Sinclair. Paul, your line is now open. Speaker McCarthy, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. It's on the Twitter versus Trump controversy that continues. The, the president's tweet wasn't taken down. So does that really constitute censorship to put a link with more information alongside it? It wasn't taken down, but my belief they put a, an arbiter of the truth that actually came through to said whether it was tr truthful or not. That individual with Twitter has his own personal bias. Um, so I don't think that's the appropriate person. If you listen to what Zuckerberg said, he does not believe these social media companies should be the arbiter of truth of everything that people say online. That it's a platform for people to express themselves. That they could say one thing and say another. Um, Twitter seems to be wanting to do something different. And that, that is what's concerning. Another question. May I follow up, please? Sure. When it sure. comes to Congress's role in this, you've already had a few years to try and strike the balance between free speech and making sure it's an even platform for everyone to express themselves. Where do you go from here as this executive order takes shape? Well, I think Congress should actually have hearing. When I was majority leader, that's what we did. Um, we had Jack from Twitter come in. We had Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we had Sanjay from Google as well. And the one thing you do when there is a problem and the world continues to change, and think about how powerful these companies are. Almost 90% of all searches go through Google. If you're not on the front page, 95% drop off. Influence what you see and what you know. We watched in a campaign the day after the last presidential election, people talking about the things they did to influence it, different programs. I watched an election before a California um, election that um, Wikipedia put up that um, Republican, California Republicans is Nazism. That's influence. And I think that's why committees should have hearings on this and be able to look before they draft legislation. One more question. No more from Zoom. No more from Zoom. No All right. Zoom. Yes, sir. Going back to China briefly, what sort of congressional action would you like to see lawmakers take in regards to China and coronavirus? Well, the first thing I'd like to see is that it's not a diversion. I'd like to get to the truth. So let's have some open hearings about it. Where did it come from? What did they know? And when did they know it? Then I'd like to go even further. Never again should America ever have to be a supply chain beholden to China. We should relook at many different situations. What's happening in our universities? Why did the FBI have to arrest uh, one, of the, uh, one of the professors from Harvard being paid by China? What have they stolen? What, are, what is China doing right now while America is trying to develop a vaccine? China and, and Iran are talking about um, hacking in, which is delays our ability to get that vaccine and even trying to steal it. There are so many questions that need to be raised. But unfortunately, the Speaker has a great deal of control in the House. She believes it's a diversion. So Republicans won't stop there. That's why we put a task force. It's good to see that there are some Democrats who, di who disagree with the Speaker. We welcome them to join that task force because we believe we should look at this as Americans together. Look, the virus is here. We did not invite it. We did not want it, and it came from a foreign land. That's not a diversion. That's a lot of questions. And we will defeat it together. Yes. On sanctions or specific legislation about it? I, I think there could be a number of actions for it. That's why I would gather all the information. And I would want it to be bipartisan in what we're able to do. Unfortunately, the majority party inside Congress today believes it's a diversion. I don't think those families that don't have family members coming home thinks it's a diversion. I think they should be held accountable. And what's appropriate to held accountable? Let's gather the information and let's have an appropriate response. Does that work? Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, you said uh, about proxy voting that it empowers the speaker. It does. And you referenced the California members. Um, so I spoke to a couple of them, and, and they told me that basically they had been in touch 
throughout the day with their proxy that they had sent very specific written directions as to how they wanted to vote on each item. So I'm just wondering if that's the way that they're, the course they're going in this proxy voting. How does it empower the speaker? Speaker gets to control the, 20 people can control all of Congress. It empowers the speaker on what comes before the floor and able to do. Did you ask that same question of Charlie Chris? Was he able to be at the launch and be monitoring what's happening on the floor? If those individuals that are monitoring happening on the floor, did you ask them the first question? When they signed the letter that they physically could not come, did you ask them what physically, why they could not come? I mean, that's the first thing I would ask, since the speaker said this would only be used in severe situations and only if you physically could not come. I'm from California. The speaker's from California. She's from Northern. I'm from Southern. We were able to make it. There's a number of members who are able to make it. So I'm concerned. If somebody was and they had COVID or they're around somebody, understand completely. But that doesn't give them a right to vote. Every single vote we have, there are members who cannot come. The Constitution says we are supposed to assemble. Their constituents loan them the power for every two years. They don't loan them the power to give it to somebody else. So yes, how was the largest bill that was ever passed in the history of Congress able to be put on the floor, voted with never going through committee? The speaker kept everybody away. The speaker wrote a bill, then brought you back and only had one choice. Are they ever to be a part of the committee and have debate? How well are they monitoring it from the floor? Are they only seeing what television is giving them? Or are they able to engage with other members throughout the floor? Those are the concerns that I would have. It's unconstitutional. Yes? You used your protection bill yesterday. Yeah. 413 to 1. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you don't think that bill was unconstitutional. Listen. A bill itself that I support doesn't mean whether it's unconstitutional or not. It's the manner in which you vote for it. I'm not arguing about whether a bill's good or bad. I'm arguing the structure in which it's passed. Do you follow what the Constitution asked us to do? Why would you endanger a bill like that, where overwhelmingly all of Congress supports it, and have people do it by proxy? In the guidelines for a proxy, it literally says, if you're having problems, the staff could direct how for you to vote. When was the staff ever elected? So it's, it's not the bill, it's the structure of how you perform it. That's what the Constitution requires, and that's what we should do. No, 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 you're not. You're, maybe again, I didn't clarify what I said. In the guidelines, read the guidelines. If this person who's monitoring what's going on has a problem sending what they're doing. Staff can send it in. Well, how do you know that the member told the staff to send that in? I think that's a real concern. Yes, sir. They didn't give you a chair? What's wrong? Anyway, I like to keep the floor. The country now is more than 100,000 dead. The president in late February said the number of cases would be close to zero. He has repeatedly said that this is under control and that it would go away by the summer. Do you think the president gave the country false assurances about how bad and how deadly this virus would be? No, because I've been in meetings in the Situation Room, bipartisan, bicameral, where Dr. Fauci almost gave me the exact same answer. That, that this would go away like a, a fluenza, that they were prepared for it. He also told me masks shouldn't be worn only if you're sick. So yeah, I think every day people learn something more about this. I think when President Trump made the decision to stop the flights coming from China, when 22 other people sitting in that room thought something differently, yeah, the president made a right decision, even though those who are giving him information didn't have the right information. And if you really want to go back and you really, I know you're concerned about the president, I wish you would be concerned, if you're concerned about those 100,000 such as I am and their families, let's go to where this started. So when, when it first came forward that this came out in China, what did China do? Yeah, they stopped flights, but only domestically. They allowed it to go internationally. When President Trump offered to President Xi that we would send our experts and our doctors and others and they denied, did the president make a wrong decision then? When the World Health Organization told the entire world that it doesn't transfer from human to human, and he still shut down those flights, did the president make a wrong decision? 
No, he did not. If you are going to try to judge him when you're sitting and looking what China has done, it's appalling to me your question in itself. Let's stop playing political games about people who lost their lives. Why don't we know that we now have a virus here that came from a far land that lied to an entire world and let flights go knowingly? And while they were doing that, they were hoarding all the personal protection equipment. People are not going home. People have died because of this. And the idea that you want to ask a question politically in that basis, to me, is what's wrong. Our focus should be on solving this. Our focus should be making sure we get a vaccine, making sure we get the antibodies. That's exactly what we're doing. I was just talking to a CEO yesterday of a pharmaceutical company, the fourth one that has BARDA, that they're going through, and it's very promising. They believe they can have the vaccine this year. And what we are doing as a government, by, by, yes, President Trump, were we supplying the funding so we could have 100 million of those dosage if it comes to fruition? That it's faster than we've ever done before. The FDA is approving things that they've never done before. We just hit 15 million tests. Weigh that with everybody else in the world. Have they done that? You didn't ask that question. I understand the questions you want to ask. I think the health of America is too important. I think what we're continuing to build. Would I want everything? I'd want a vaccine today. I would have wanted our scientists and our doctors to be allowed to go in China. I would have want them to be honest with the rest of the world. And the one thing I'd want to is stop playing politics with this and let's save more lives. Thank you for your question. All have a good day.